I've got a lot to share with you about uh, what's going on in Kenya, and I'm going to try to play. i got a couple videos I'm going to share with you. This um, right here is just a, a sample of the feeding that we were able to do this, uh, this week. Uh, how many total, Michael? 1,200? Was it more than that? Send the, send the number to my, my phone. But it was just an incredible uh, thing. And, and once again, um, we, God allowed us to find people um, who were nearly starved to death. And we were able to reach them just in time. Uh, just a little over 1,200. With some of the families, we have gotten into the habit of giving them extra portions, especially if they have a large family there. Um, again, beautiful people, but there's no one else up there that will help them. Uh, the government won't help them. Uh, the Catholic Church won't help them. They, uh, of course, you remember they ran us out of our um, office building that we had rented. They ran us out of it saying that they needed that space to store food. Uh, I guess they're still storing the food there because we know for a fact they haven't given it to anybody. Uh, but all you need to do is just look at the faces. Now, this family here... Um, blesses my heart. Let me see if I can get that playing. Uh, it's a father and looks like about five kids. The day that we found them, their mother had just passed away yes, the day before. Uh, this man's wife had died. And so now he is raising uh, these children on his own. Uh, when we caught up with them or our team caught up with them, uh, the father and the oldest girl there dressed in the green uh, were very sick, and um, we had to give them medical attention. Uh, I found out after I heard all this that the man's blind, and it was the wife that was assisting with the daily needs of the family and uh, helping him and whatever he needed. And now it's left up to those children. And um, so it's, uh, I guess it's, a, it's just another family that we're going to try to stay in touch with to make sure that they have the things that they need. Uh, let me play this video for you. Um, I actually got to see how they make gravel in Kenya. Do you know how they make gravel in Kenya? Guys sitting down with hammers beating rocks until they're small enough. That's how they make gravel in Kenya. These stones that you see here um, are the stones. These were hand cut. What were they, about 40 cents a piece? And um, these will be the stones that will eventually be uh, the building that we're going to build on the property that we bought um, so that we can di dis distribute the food, the food there and uh, eventually move our radio station office there to have a permanent place that belongs to us that nobody can kick us out of. Uh, there's a story that I can't, I can't, I really don't want to share all the details. But Satan has tried so hard to stop what we're doing there that how can I put this now that I've brought it up? Um, let's just say that a situation occurred where the police got involved and the government could have shut us down just like that. And as far as Michael, myself, and 
a lot of the people at the radio station, they didn't do anything wrong. But it was a situation where there was something that was something going on that wasn't right. And the police did get involved and they could have shut us down very easily. And God's kept us going throughout all this. Uh, so uh, some, some people here know a little bit about the situation. Um, but uh, it's just one of those things where if God's in it, he blesses it, he keeps it going. If he's not, he'll shut it down. He'll tell us when he's done. Amen. That's just how it works. Amen. All right. The title of tonight's message was, I was wrong. All you got to do is ask my mom, my sister, and my wife. And they'll tell you the same thing. Take a Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start out with this. I, I, I've actually taught this before. Uh, it's a neat little study. And actually, the, the, the majority of tonight's teaching came from one of our followers, um, well, I'm just, my mind's a blank now. Can't think of his name. But anyway, he sent me this in a text message earlier this week. And I went, I like that. I'm going to use that. Uh, but anyway, the first part of this, I'm setting you up for what's coming later. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, here's what the Bible says. Speaking the truth in love. Amen. It's not enough to just be right about what you believe and what you say and what you say to people that are wrong, what you say to sinners who are still in sin. When you go to tell them the truth, if you don't do it in love, you are doing the cause of Jesus Christ a great disservice. Somebody say amen. The only people that Jesus ever really got angry with was the religious hierarchy that he knew was never going to change. Now, when it came to Nicodemus, he didn't treat Nicodemus the way he treated all the other Pharisees. He was kind to Nicodemus. He told him the truth. You must be born again. He told him the truth in love. And I'm sure others as well. But when it came to all of the other sinners that Jesus encountered, he spoke to them in love. He told them the truth, but he told them the truth in love. And if we don't love the sinners that we're trying to reach, then we're worthless as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. Somebody say amen. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, Christ which is the head, even Christ. So I want you to think of the body. Christ is the head, verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body under the edifying in, in, of itself in love. I was talking to somebody today. And they said, you know, Pastor, I could never do what you do. You get in front of a microphone, a camera, or whatever, and you're good at it. I could never do that. But I said, don't worry about it, because everybody, if you're a member of the body of Christ, everybody has a place in that body. And every member of that body, every cell of that body matters when it comes to Jesus Christ. He doesn't love one more than he does love the other. Somebody say amen. And that's what this is telling us, that Christ is the head and he has fitly joined together the entire body. So I had mentioned this a couple years ago, that in your spine, this is how the head speaks to the body. The head is where the brain is. The brain sends electric impulses down the spinal cord through the 33 bones of your back. Turn, uh, turn, to, um, turn to Exodus 33. 
I like this. Exodus 33. And if you remember, it's in this chapter that Moses wanted to see God. Wanted to see him. And God said, can't do it, Moses. No can do. It'll kill you. But here's what we're going to do. If you look in verse 20 of Exodus 33, he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the, cli in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see what? My back parts. And that, to me, that's interesting. We're in the 33rd chapter of Exodus. We're dealing with the back, which has 33 bones in it. And what God is going to show of himself to Moses is those 33 bones of his back. And what he's doing, this is a foreshadow of someone who later came and lived and died at age 33, which was Jesus Christ. Amen? So the the, the backbone represents Christ and it's from your backbone that every other bone in your body is connected. The, the, the feet, the toes, the legs, the hips that connect to the backbone, your ribs connect to the backbone, the arms through the soldier, shoulders connect to the backbone, everything connects to the backbone and the backbone connects to the head. So we have a direct connection to the brain. So think of, think of it like this. Everything from here up is in heaven. Everything from here down is in this earth. Okay? Think of it like that. So the part of God that came to this earth was Christ represented by the 33 bones of your spine. Amen? So far? So, and that's what he meant. The whole body fitly joined together through those 33 bones. Now, Christ is the head. The church is the body. So how does the body, or how does the head speak to the body? We know that it happens through the, the spinal column, your spine, and there are 33 bones in your spine, and out of each one, a set of nerves receiving electrical impulses from the brain down to the nerve bundles that exit each side of your spine, making 66 total nerve bundles connecting the brain to the body and vice versa. How many of you remember me teaching this a while back? How many books are there in your Bible? 66. The exact same amount. Amen? And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world I'd ever seen. I always say that to everything neat I find in the Bible. And I taught that. But I was wrong. And a guy called me out on it. I mean, he did it nicely. He did it. He was in, he was in our group, Steve. And he did it nicely, respectfully. But he said, uh, I think pastor's wrong. And I'm going, nah, nah. Well, I went and looked it up. And let me go back to this. Starting with the first spine, from, from every bone, spinal bone in your backbone, you have a set of nerve bundles. One goes out to the left side of your body. The other goes out to the right side of the body. And that's how the brain tells my hand what to do, this hand what to do, my feet, when I change position with my feet or when I walk, my brain is sending those signals through those nerve bundles that are coming out of my backbone. But here's the problem. You do, while you do have 33 bones in your spinal column, the bottom four are fused together and there are no nerve bundles that exit those bottom four spinal bones. And I didn't know that. I was wrong. So I'm going, well, I'm not going to be wrong. I can tell you that. 
because I, I got to thinking about it, how perfect it was that God speaks to us through the 66 books of the Bible and that it seemed to me that there would be 66 nerve bundles coming out. John, you're getting ahead of me here. John's already going, what where, where are these four, right? Now, take a look at your Bible. You've got the Old Testament. You got the New Testament. And you have the four books that join them together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And who are they talking about? Which came from where? Where did Jesus come from? He came directly from heaven. Remember, where's heaven? Everything above here is heaven. Everything below here is the earth, okay? So I got to thinking about this, the sacrum. That's what that is called. Your tailbone is called the sacrum. Anybody know Latin? Huh? Sacrum comes from the, where we get the word sacred. Okay? But it's not the kind of sacred that we would think of because of the fact, I want you to think about this for a minute, that there are no messages from the brain that goes through these bottom four bones. None. Meaning the head does not speak down here. Are you with me so far? Okay. And incidentally, in the practice of yoga, don't practice yoga. Stay away from it. I don't care what church says, oh, we do yoga at our church. We do yoga for Jesus. No, you don't. There's no way possible you can do yoga for Jesus because it's not for Jesus. Okay? You know what the word yoga means? Yoke. Be not unequally yoked together. And the, the, the word yoga is from Hindu mysticism and the practice of yoga yokes you or connects you to the 330 million gods that God told us not to have anything to do with. Okay? Now let me read this to you. And this is what the sacrum represents in kundalini yoga. In yogic spiritual anatomy, the sacrum is the home of the kundalini. A serpent energy. Think about it. The bottom four of your backside where God, the head, does not speak. That's where Satan dwells. That is crazy. Now watch this. A serpent-like energy that sits coiled at the base of the spine. Kundalini energy is the individuated form of Shakti, the divine life force. Do you know what Shakti is? Shakti, and I'm not going to do this to John, lay hands on no man suddenly, but let's say that we're at a charismatic revival and I'm going down the aisles and I hit people on the head and they feel this electrical energy that makes them jerk and gyrate and fall backward when no such thing is ever given in scriptures. That's what Shakti is. Shakti is, is, an, is an energy force, and what that term means is a devil. It's a devil, plain and simple. So... They call it the divine life force. So now does the word sacrum make sense? Because to them, their God dwells. And you know what? If Satan's going to dwell anywhere, he can dwell here as far as I'm concerned. Amen? The sacrum is also the location of the Svadasthana Chakra, one of the seven major energy centers in the body. This chakra is associated with emotions, creativity, fornication. It's governed by the element of water and characterized by flow, movement, flexibility, hip opening, poses, practice for sacral health, also helps activate the sacral chakra. Chakra basically means an energy vortex. It's a devil is what it is. 
What was Mary Magdalene's problem that Jesus delivered her from? Seven devils. The seven chakras were the seven devils, I believe, that she had. He delivered her from this. Okay? Now, uh, let me go past this. So, since I was wrong that there's not 66 nerve bundles coming out of your spine to connect to your body, the bottom four don't exist. I kept thinking there still has to be four nerve, nerve packages that come from the brain down into the body, and I was right. I was wrong, but now I'm right. You have 12 sets of nerves that originate in the brain, not that don't go through the spinal cord. The brain is heaven. And most deal with control of the head, i.e. tongue and jaw movement, taste, smell, etc. But four of them extend directly from the brain down into the body. Think about it. Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John came directly down from heaven to us down here. Okay? And two of them are called the accessory nerves. They control neck movement and when you shrug your shoulders. The other two, I want you to remember these next two. They're called the vagus nerve. Who's ever heard of the vagus nerve? Okay, a lot of you have. Okay? It goes directly from the head... And let me read this. Vagus nerve, historically cited as the pneumogastric nerve, is the 10th cranial nerve and interfaces with the parasympathetic, parasympathetic control of the heart, lungs, digestive tract. It actually comprises two nerves, the left and right vagus nerves, but they're typically referred to collectively in the singular. So what, I, what it amounts to is, is that it connects the brain directly to your lungs, your heart, your stomach, your kidneys, your bowels, and all of this area here. So when you are excited about something or when you are in fear of something, does it affect your heart, lungs, bowels, stomach? Does it affect those things? Okay, it does. Who remembers the first time you touched your girlfriend's hand? Did it affect your heart, lungs, stomach, everything else? Of course it did, okay? Now remember that. Remember that. So I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Uh, it's just like DNA. You have the two rungs of DNA, Old and New Testament, and the four that join them together. Those four are different than all of the rest of them, okay? And like we found this out when we were looking at the bone structure. How do bones connect to muscles? There's actually four stages where muscle tissue starts turning into bone tissue and bone tissue starts turning into muscle tissue. They meet together. When the trumpet sounds... Where are we going to meet Jesus at? All the way up in heaven? No, halfway. He's coming down here. We're coming up here to be with him, to meet Jesus in the air. Just like the bones and your muscles coming together. There's four different stages that it goes in, joining together in the middle. In other words, the bone becomes like the muscle, and the muscle becomes like the bone. You see how that is? Apply that to a marriage. After 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 60 years of marriage, the husband becomes more like the wife, and the wife becomes more like the husband every single day. They finish each other's sentences. The guy does learn it is important to keep the toilet seat down takes 30 years, but after a while, they get it right. Now, 
It was Joshua put me onto this. First John 4, 6, turn there. We'll use this as the basis. This is really what I wanted to talk about tonight. The spirit of truth versus the spirit of error. And I want you to notice that being wrong or right actually has a spirit attached to it. You, if you've been listening to me, I appreciate it. If you've been listening to me since January, I really appreciate it. Because God has dealt with me about Bible reading versus Internet reading. And I'm not kidding you. They were telling me, uh, Kevin was telling me about the uh, lack of rain going on around the country. I said, really? I said, we've got plenty of rain. It's rained well here in, in our area. But apparently places around the country, they haven't had very much rain. I didn't know that. I used to get up, wake up in the morning, flip TV on and watch the news. Now I watch Leave It to Beaver. And I'm a lot happier when I leave the house watching Leave It to Beaver. So I really, I mean, there's not a whole lot that I know about what's going on. First John 4, 6, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. And I'm wrestling. I have just been wrestling all year long trying to get people to read their Bible instead of reading junk on the Internet. And it's been, it's aggravated me. It's angered me. It has, um, it's bothered me. It's, it's depressed me. But here's, this, this is the scary part. And I won't say if you're not listening to me, you don't have God. What I'm telling you is if you're not listening to what's in this book, read what that says. He that is not of God heareth not us. It's plain and simple. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So I want you to notice this now. That truth has a spirit attached to it and error has a spirit attached to it. And people who refuse what's right have a spirit lying to them and they believe the lies. There are people who want to know the truth, believe the truth, understand the truth. They have a spirit in them guiding them in all truth. Does that make sense to everybody? And um, Isaiah 66, 4, God said, I will also choose their delusions. God's in charge of what people are going to believe. And I've been saying this for years. Some, some of you on the Internet all the time, though you know all of the conspiracy theories right down to the letter, you're going to receive a mark in your right hand or in your forehead, and God is going to make sure you do it because he's going to choose your delusion. And you're going to believe a lie. God said, I will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. What do you think delights God about you? The fact that you know all the conspiracy theories on the Internet, the fact that you follow this, this guy or that guy or that woman or that doctor or whatever, or the fact that you'd say, you know what, I'd just rather read my Bible and believe that. That's what God is looking for. Second Thessalonians, there's only two places in the whole Bible where the word delusions used. One of them is in Isaiah 66, 4. The other one is 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Both of these verses... Both of them are telling you God is going to make you believe a lie. And why? God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And what uh, 
Joshua brought to me was the Greek word for delusion and error was the same word. And I didn't know that. Now, you know I don't get big into Greek, but God did write the New Testament, the Old Testament. He wrote it in Hebrew and Aramaic, and he wrote the New Testament in Greek. They were perfect then. They're still perfect now. The English is perfect now, so I'm not using the Greek or the Hebrew to change everything, but I'm telling you that, that, that God will connect them together. Delusions and errors go along with one another. And here's, when he showed me this, he said, just look this up. You go to blueletterbible.com and you can find out from your King James what Greek word is there. As soon as I saw this one, I knew exactly what was related to it. The Greek word for error and delusion, translated as error or delusion in the King James, is the Greek word plan A. And I told Josh, I said, Josh, guess what? The very next word in the Strong's Concordance is planetase, and it's where we get the word planet. Now, that word planetase is translated in the King James as wandering stars, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Jude said, raging waves, he's talking about the false prophets. They are raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, why are stars important, especially when you're trying to go from one place to the next? For centuries, man has used the stars to navigate his way both on land and sea. And the reason why they call planets planets is... I know like two constellations, Orion and the Big Dipper. Those are the only two I know. I can recognize them. So I got Orion here, and I got Mars sitting next to it. So the, all the ancient astronomers noticed, and I got Mars bigger than actually Mars is. When you look up in the sky, you can't see Mars this big. It looks like this little dot. But they noticed that some of these dots... One month, Mars would be here. The next month, Mars would be there. And they called them planetes, wandering stars, because they didn't follow all of the other stars every year. They, they moved all the time. And that's, number one, the conspiracy theories on the Internet it's the same lie they were telling five years ago and 10 years ago and 15 years ago. They just keep changing the time frame, the names of it, how it's going to be done, on and on and on. But it's the exact same lie. And people don't recognize, or they do recognize it, they just don't care. And you get guys on the internet who make claims like when Jesus is going to come or when the tribulation is going to start or how the, or this is the mark of the beast, it turns out three years later they were completely wrong, but people still go to their websites every day, listen to their blogs, and follow them and believe every word they say. They're following wandering stars. Same thing with the Bible translations. Because... They keep changing the Greek New Testament every 10, 15 years. The Bible companies have to retranslate the Bibles and sell you a brand new Bible every 10 to 15 years that they change the words from what they had 15 years ago. Those are wandering stars. Meanwhile, us idiotic, stupid, ignorant, unlearned King James people have been memorizing and reading the same Bible all of our life. And they didn't change John 3.16. It's been the same for 400 and some odd years. Somebody say amen. See, that's a spirit of truth. Because truth, if it's really truth, it doesn't wander. And it doesn't change every year into something else. Somebody say amen. Proverbs 21, 16, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. See, I've had people call this church a dead church because we didn't have a rock band. 
and we didn't have fog machines and we didn't have big light shows and I didn't come out wearing my shirt untucked with holes in my jeans. Amen. That's the first thing. First, I ain't kidding. First thing she said, we're singing victory in Jesus tonight. Yes, ma'am. What? Amen. You see, they call us dead, Kevin. But look what your Bible says. The congregation of the dead is full of people that wandered out of the way of understanding. What's the way of understanding? The Bible. They wandered away from it. And while they can bring and stir up emotions in people's hearts, they're still spiritually dead because they will not follow and heed to the Word of God. We have Southern Baptist churches in this county accepting of homosexual marriages, accepting people in positions in their churches of homosexuals, yes? She's a woman. Congregation of the dead. Jeremiah 14, 10, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. And think about the difference. What did God do with your sin? Will, what did God do with your sin? He forgot them. He doesn't remember them anymore. That's another song we need to sing. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. Who knows that song? Well, we're going to have to print that one up and sing it tomorrow. Amen. I'll be up till 1 o'clock in the morning making soundtracks for all these things. Amen. Uh, Lamentations 4.14. They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. Wandered as blind men. They have eyes. Turn to, um, turn to Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29. Isaiah 28 is about the drunkards of Ephraim. And Isaiah 29, yeah, yeah, look at verse 9 of Isaiah 29. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. They have a spirit in them. And the, for the Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. You see, this is, this is how we who are children of the day and can see that day that the Lord appears will not overtake us as a thief. But that day to those who are drunk and asleep, that day will overtake them as a thief. So he's poured out upon them the spirit of deep sleep and have closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. Seers were the prophets. And the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned. In other words, we, we hired Dr. Dr. So-and-so to be our pastor. He's got a doctorate. And so we pay him well. And we wanted a doctor. I, I had your pastor, Mike Hutzel, when he was out in Broken Arrow, he had a guy come to him that had been a member of that church, and he told Mike, he said, you know, he said, I love you, Pastor Mike, but he said, I just, I just have a hard time listening to you. And Mike said, why? He said, because you don't have a, you're not a doctor. You don't have a degree. What has that got to do with anything? Because right here it says, which men deliver to one that has learned, saying, read this. And he said, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. 
Verse 13, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of who? Men, not God. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us and who knoweth us? Um... There was a promise. Now look at verse 18. There's a good promise here. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of, out of obscurity and out of darkness. Matt, you told me about how, God, you grew up in a, in a church that used the NIV, and all of a sudden God started dealing with you, and all of a sudden you just realized that King James was the Word of God. And that, didn't come, that was before you ever started listening to me. He, he just said, God just said, this is the book right here. And he, and he believed it. Amen. That's how it works. Somebody say amen. God, open your eyes. Amen. Hillsong Church. The founder, Brian Crocodile Houston, charged with concealing homosexual pedophile sex crimes committed against a seven-year-old boy by his father. His father was a pedophile preying on children in this church and his dad's dead now they can't charge him so they're going after Brian Houston because he covered it up he helped conceal it you see that's a that's a turn to turn back to Isaiah 28 verse 7 they have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way. Who is the way? He's the way, the truth, and the life. Through strong drink, they err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there's no place clean. So you have a pastor spewing out vomit to a congregation all over, literally all over the world and the dogs lap it up. They eat this stuff up. They'll defend that guy. Job chapter 6, verse 24. He said, teach me and I will hold my tongue. You listen to this. I want you to listen to this. It's better to listen and learn than speak. Amen? Teach me and I will hold my tongue. And cause me to understand wherein I have erred. How forcible are right words. You see, the truth has force to it. The truth never changes. It's not corrupted or changed over time just because everybody and their lifestyle changes. The truth still doesn't change. Somebody say amen. A man is married to a woman. Okay? And, and lots of other things that could be mentioned. Truth stays the truth throughout all the ages. How forcible are right words. But what doth your arguing reprove? Do you imagine to reprove words and the speeches of one that is desperate, which are as wind? Yea, ye overwhelm the fatherless, and you dig a pit for your friend. Now, therefore, be content, look upon me, for it is evident unto you if I lie. In other words, cause me to understand. You can tell that you have the right spirit in you when you can go to God and say, God, show me where I'm wrong. Not, God, show everybody that I'm right. God, show me where I'm wrong. Second Samuel, turn there. There was a, a big, big, bad sin that was committed concerning the Ark of the Covenant. If you remember, um, the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines. God allowed it to be stolen. And the Philistines, after thousands of people being killed and dying... They decided they didn't want the Ark of the Covenant anymore, so they sent it back, and it rested, I believe, at the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom. 
I may be wrong on that, but I think if I remember right, that's where it, and it stayed there for years. When David finally became king, he sought to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem so that God's presence, God's throne, could have a house to dwell in. David's, I guess his intentions were right, but somebody messed up really, really bad when it came time to move the Ark of the Covenant. Notice what it says. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. In other words, God, God, sat, God sits right now on the Ark of the Covenant in heaven and literally two angels and their wings cover God and his presence there while he sits on that throne. That's where Christ's blood was delivered, I believe, to the ark of God in heaven, not on earth, to the one in heaven as a perpetual um, covering or atonement for man's sins. So, verse 3, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Now, what did we do wrong here? Stop right here. What did we do wrong? The Ark of the Covenant was only to be carried one way only. That way. How many men? Isn't that neat? Because it represents the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But it also matches Ezekiel 1. How many cherubim are carrying the throne of God in Ezekiel 1? Four of them. So what's in heaven and what's in earth must match. They must be the same. And we're talking about the gospel here. And I guess churches have good intentions that they say they want people to know Jesus. But there is a wrong way to go about it. You can preach the wrong gospel and deliver Jesus in the wrong way. I got a phone call from a guy several years ago who called me from a church in this area and said, uh, is this Mike Hargan? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm pastor so-and-so of such and such church. I said, okay. And he said, I want to know why you've been talking about me. And I went, who are you? And he told me his name again. And he said, I've heard from people who have told me that you've been bad-mouthing me, bad-mouthing my church and the way we do things. And he said, I want to know why. And I said, who are you again? He told me his name. I said, let me be honest with you. Up until 10 seconds ago, I never knew of your existence. Much less ever talked about you or I don't know anything about you. I knew a little bit about the church that he, and it was one of these sort of new agey, everybody, let's, you know, they allow people to remain in sin while they come to church. They don't try to change anybody. And, and I said, now, I will tell you this. I preach the word of God, and I think there's a right way for Christians and churches to be, and a wrong way for Christians and churches to be, and if that's what you heard, then yeah, I probably did say that. I don't know who you heard it from, but I probably did say that. And he said, well, I guess we're just trying to reach two different type of people. I said, no, sir, we're not. We're, I'm trying to reach sinners, but I'm going to do it the gospel way. The problem was they were trying to move the Ark of the Covenant and deliver the mercy seat of God in a way that God did not prescribe. It was the same as what Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. And look what happened. 
So they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah and, and Ahio and the sons of Abinadab drave the new cart and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was at Gibeah according to the ark, accompanying the ark of God and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, of fir wood, even on harps and psalteries and timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. They, had, they, had, they were playing gospel music. Does that count? No. Not when you go against the word of God. And verse 6, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his what? Error. It was the spirit. And there he died by the ark of God, and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon us, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. It wasn't until David brought some Levite priests to carry it the right way that God blessed it, and they blew trumpets and they shouted, by the way. You get that one, right? Amen. Turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. Everybody say amen to that. What is that word present tense, that, that word is? That's present tense. That means that it still is perfect. It cannot be wrong and still be the word of God. Cannot be wrong. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What is it that converts the soul? Is it, this, is it the singing that we just did? That was good singing. But gospel concerts don't save people. Gospel music doesn't save people. And I like gospel music. Gospel music doesn't save people. It is the word of God that converts the soul and only the perfect word of God. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are. See, there's another present tense word. So far we've had one, two, three present tense words describing the Bible as being at this very present moment right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord, here's another one, is pure, enlightening the eyes. Four times. Your Bible told you that the Bible is still right in everything it says. And see, if you have the spirit that accompanies this book, you don't have a problem believing that. That doesn't go against anything. When God dealt with you, did you argue with him? Look at that. Let him shake his head going, uh-uh, I didn't do that. You look like beaver this morning. Dad, I didn't do that. I didn't either. When God came into my office and said, Mike, you know this Bible's right, I did not argue with God. My, my white flag came out, I surrendered, and that was it. This Bible's right. So verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are, look, here's it's more present tense language, are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand, listen to this now, who can understand his errors? You see, what we like, our ego tells us that we're right about everything. And we want to win all the arguments. But the truth of it is, we're not as smart as we think we are. We're not as right as we think we are. And how can we even know that? Reading the Word of God. Who can understand his errors? You have errors, but you want them gone. Cleanse thou me, watch this, from secret faults. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have secret faults. You know why? Because I already know you do. Everybody does. Everybody. 
body does. But you see, those who have the spirit of truth in them, they're the ones from time to time, whether they come forward at the end of a service or in the car one day or at home one night, or as they go to bed, they lay down crying and say, God, show me where I'm not living right. Show me, God, where I need to change. You men, God, show me how to be a better husband. Because I can be bad at it. Really bad. Show me how to love my wife more. Show me how to be a blessing to my children more. God, show me how to do that because I don't know how to do that. The ladies, the spirit of truth is in you. You go to God and you say, God, show me how to be a better wife. Show me how to be loving to my husband and support him. Show me, show me wisdom so I can teach them to my children and my grandchildren. That's what the spirit of truth does in a person when he has the spirit of truth in him. He wants to know where his wrongs are and how God can change him. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let, let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. The great transgression's coming. That great transgression is also that day when everybody is going to believe the strong delusion. They're going to believe the lie. And there's going to be a great transgression take place on that day. And I may not be able to say exactly what it is. I've got a few good ideas. But I believe when that day comes, God, if we have the spirit of truth in us, will show us, don't do that, don't touch that, don't go anywhere near that, stay away from that, and stay away from those people, and we'll do it. But those who have a spirit of error in them are going to jump right on it. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, today if you will hear his voice, watch this, harden not your what? He did not say, harden not your brain. He didn't say, harden, don't, harden not your mind. He said, harden not your heart, as in the provocation. What was the provocation? It was the day that the 12 spies came back, and 10 of them said, we can't go into that land. It's full of giants. We're gonna, they're going to kill us all. While two of them said, yes, we can. Let's go. And they all rebelled against God, and God said, fine, you're going to wander now for 40 years until your carcass rots in the wilderness. Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err where? Your error is not in your mind. It is in your heart. That they have, and they have not known my ways. How do you not know God's ways? You don't read his word. That's how you not know God's ways. You don't read his word. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And they all perished in the wilderness. Now, I mentioned the heart here. Harden not your heart. They err in their heart. Remember that vagus nerve. Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. Notice how God tied those two things together. When God gives you a new heart, he gives you a new spirit. And when he gives you a new spirit, you start singing new music and you start watching new stuff on TV. You don't watch it at all. And you stop reading stupid stuff on the internet and you read his word. Amen. And you go to church. Amen. New heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I was thinking of Larry Ziegler. 
You remember Larry Ziegler? When I was a teenager in this church, Larry Ziegler, God got a hold of his heart. He said this real big bushy beard. Now, I don't know what it was, but he got saved, and then two weeks later, the beard's gone. And I'm going, you know, he's not really that good looking. I wish he'd kept the beard. But he just said, God told him to shave the beard, so he shaved the beard. Bill Chandler had long hair, got saved. Nobody, nobody had to tell him nothing. A month later, cuts his hair. Mike Henderson, same thing. I, God tells me to go talk to him. I go talk to him. Three days later, he comes to church. He gets his heart right back with God. He's got a big old long ponytail. I never said a word. He cut his ponytail. Because why? It's in our nature. Amen? When God puts a new heart in you, you don't have to follow the rules. You want to follow the rules. And he said, uh, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. Romans 2, 29, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. Here he did it again. He connected the heart with the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. Romans 10, 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Not with the brain, the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but just so I had a source to tell you what I'm going to tell you. This doctor, Ali M. Al-Shami, whoever he is, discovered that the heart has its own little brain or intrinsic cardiac nervous system. This heart brain is composed of approximately 40,000 neurons that are just like the neurons in the brain. In other words, the same thing that God gave you up here in your head, he put in your heart. When God said you believe with your heart, that wasn't a metaphor. Because God knew those neurons were there all along. He put them there. He said, what you're gonna believe, you're gonna believe with your heart, not your mind. See, when you believe something with your mind, somebody can change your mind. But when you believe something with your heart, it's the Spirit of God who put that in there. And can man take it away from you? There ain't a man in the world who can preach it out of you. Somebody say amen. So that vagus nerve is God, through the Gospels, speaking directly to the heart of man, because that's what it's connected to. Heart, lungs, liver, gallbladder, stomach, intestines, bladder, generative organs. It's God reaching down to the things that are vital to us, but especially the heart. This, turn to Ezekiel 14. I preached this a while back, but I wondered why people that, I'll say this, people who used to come to homecoming who don't come no more and won't come unless God does a work in their life, why they ended up believing some of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. Mandela effect, flat earth, you name it, they, they fall for it. And I'm going, how does that happen? Because it doesn't make sense. And then it dawned on me they don't believe it with their brain. They believe it with their heart. And because they believe it with their heart, it shows that they have not a spirit of truth. They have a different spirit. And ask yourself the question, can you be saved with a spirit of error living in your heart? Ezekiel 14, 3, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stump block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired at all by them? Where were their idols? In their heart. They had iniquity. Whatever those idols were, they had them in their hearts. 
Not in their church. Not in their grottoes or their gardens. Not in their temples. They had an idol in their heart. That's the worst place in the world for it to be. So, verse 4, Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols." Be careful of your secret sins. Where do you hide your secret sins? In your heart. You need to have God come in like Hezekiah or Josiah and bust them all to pieces and get them out of the house of God. So in verse 9, God said, And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. When God started taking a rod of chastisement to this preacher, I didn't think I was going to survive it. It was a bad time. Bad time. But God, what God did to me, He did in love. And what He was doing was destroying the idolatry that I had in my heart and correcting in love this preacher so that I could be used for His kingdom and His glory. And I'll never go back to those old days and those old ways. And it's not me that's doing it. It's a spirit. 1 Kings 22. This is how it works. This is in the days of Ahab. I've taught on this many times, but it just it goes along with what God said here. If the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, deceive that prophet. Who do you think allowed a familiar spirit to come up out of the ground and make Saul think it was Samuel. Who do you think allowed that? God did. So here's God doing almost the same thing. He's going to deceive Ahab because he's going to kill Ahab the next day in battle. And they're going to bring Ahab's chariot to, an, to a certain place where Ahab had Naboth killed because God said in the place where Naboth's blood was spilled, so that Sal, the dogs lick up Ahab's blood. God was going to work all of this out doing this thing. So Jehoshaphat is asking Ahab, how, how do I know? you got 400 preachers all telling you the same thing. You have the denomination telling you that this is how it is. How can we know if they're speaking right? Bring in Micaiah. Ahab says, I don't like him. He doesn't tell me what I want to hear. Bring him in anyway. I want to hear what he has to say. And Micaiah says in verse 19, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Now why did God say it that way? Because on the right hand are the sheep. The left hand are what? The goats. And where do the goats go? For eternity. To hell, to punishment, eternal torment and punishment. So I believe he's got the good angels on his right hand and he's got the evil ones on his left hand. But his hands control all of them. And if God didn't want those prophets of Ahab to lie, God would have never released that spirit on them. You understand now how it works? You have to ask the question, do I really want to know the truth? Do I want to know it? And if you do, that same spirit that was in the mouth of Ahab's prophets, God will withhold that from you, and he will speak truth to you, and you will believe it. But if you want to believe lies, I'm talking to all you and all you on the Internet. You want to believe those lies? 
it is because God already knew it and he's turned you over to it. Now, if God loves you, he'll let you wander in that wilderness for a while until you are dry, thirsty, starving to death, and you're tired of being lied to. And when you get there, you'll call out to God, just like God heard Hagar, God will reach down and he'll open your eyes and show you a well of water. He'll bring you back to the truth. And once he does that, you'll say, I'm never leaving this well ever again. So he said, verse 20, And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this matter, another said on that matter. And there came forth the spirit. See, it's a spirit of error. And stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. And they'll tell you, you know, churches just don't use the King James anymore. Are, all, are you saying all of them are going to hell? You know what? You don't have to answer that question. That's a set-up question. All you have to do is say the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So all you have to do is answer them with Scripture. And they'll lose their mind because they have no Scripture to answer you back with. But God sends lying spirits to churches every Sunday both here and around the world. And the people who want to believe the lies, the spirit of error will abide in them and they'll believe the lies. Um, in Job, I've talk, I'm, I'm trying to move on. In Job 4, a spirit passed before I think this was uh, Eliphaz, the Temanite, I think, one of Job's friends. I can't remember. But anyway, a spirit came to him in his dream and gave him words to speak to Job. And all of those words were just bold-faced lies. They were meant to try to get Job to curse God and die. It was a spirit of error. Here in Matthew chapter 4, Satan himself comes to Jesus. Satan is, a, Satan is the spirit of error. He, Jesus said he's the father of all lies. Every lie, he's the father of them. He doesn't know how to tell the truth. He knows how to mingle truth with lies, doesn't he? But he doesn't know the truth. Acts chapter 13, turn there. See how much more I got. Man, I might have to do some of this in the morning. Acts 13. When they had gone through the, verse 6, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Here's a man who's wanting to hear the Bible, the word of God, not, not preaching, not what a man says. He wants to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, Filled with the Holy Ghost. Said, see, Paul's got the spirit of truth in him. Set his eyes on him and said, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And let me tell you, the lies are not going to go away. They're only going to get worse. And I, I, I do, I wrestle with this issue. Why can't people believe the simplicity of the Word of God? Why can't they just read it? But they don't. 
And then they send me all kinds of garbage and stuff like that. I look at it and I'm just going, I can't believe you believe this. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. God had warned about that in the Old Testament. God said, I'll, t- I'll give him blindness. 2 Timothy 2.15. Turn there. Study to show thyself approved unto who? God. Not, don't study to impress me. Study the Bible to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. Stay out of arguments. What do arguments accomplish? Zero. Matthew had to argue with customers. (laughs) You got a story, yeah. I've had people call just to argue. And I'm asking you, please don't do that. Now, I do believe in come now, let us reason together. I do believe in that. If you've got a question, ask me. I'll show you from the scripture what I think. And we'll just leave leave it at that. Let God have it. Let God handle it. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You see, I think you're like me. You have a, you have a, a person in you that's a really bad person, right? Really mean, rotten, bad person. I got a guy in me that is mean and hateful and arrogant and ignorant. And you can push the right buttons in me and bring that guy out. And I'm asking you, don't do that. Shun those things. Stay away from them. If somebody's wrong and they come and want to hear from you what your answer is, give them your answer. Don't argue. Doesn't accomplish anything. It it creates more ungodliness. Their word will eat as doth a canker. Verse 17, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have what? Erred. Saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. That's their purpose. It's to overthrow people who believe and it's to take their faith away from the word of God. To cause them to not believe it. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And in this case, the iniquity is the profane and vain babblings. Um, Let's see here. Where can I go? Proverbs 10, 17, He is in the way of life that keepeth instruction, but he that refuseth reproof erreth. Proverbs 14, 22, do, do they not err that devise evil, but mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. Proverbs 19, 27, cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. If what you're reading or list, who you're listening to contradicts this book, turn them off. Stay away from them. Get away from them. Turn to Ecclesiastes 5, and I'm going to be done for tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Who who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon. And Solomon was the guy that had what you want. He had all the fishing boats, all the cars, He spent seven years building the house of God, but he spent 13 years building his own house. What does that tell you? 
He had a thousand women at his beck and call. He had money. He had kings bowing to him, paying him tribute. He had everything that every man could ever want, and God let him have it. For 40 years he had it. But God let him retain his wisdom. He's analyzing his life as he's living it. And at the end of his 40 years of having everything, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, and he said, it's vanity. Nothing in this world will ever bring you satisfaction. Nothing. So he said, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And listen, be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. What did we hear a while ago? Be, be ready to listen. Not argue. I look back now on a situation I don't think I handled right. Because a lady that had started coming to our church, she br uh, brought a, a visitor with her. It was a next-door neighbor or something like that. And I had said something, and the lady jumped in and started arguing with me. And I don't remember what it was about. But she started arguing with me, and I would read Scripture, and I'd say, well, the Bible says this. Well, she would argue with what I said. And I said, well, but the Bible says it very plainly here. It says this, and she would argue with that. And finally I said, ma'am, I'm not trying to be mean, but this is not the place to argue what God said. And she said, well, I thought this would be like an open forum. And I said, no. And I said, and this is now the mean guy starting to come out. And I'm trying to hold him back in. But what I said was, man, more than likely, you probably need to go home now and ask your husband these questions. Because that's what Paul told me. Okay. And she said something back to me. And I said, ma'am, I, th I think you probably ought to excuse yourself. And she got up and walked out. And I went to my office and I went, I don't know if I handled that right or not. But all she wanted to do was argue. And I was just reading scripture. I had, to, I had another woman do that. I mean, she had been a member here for years since I was a kid. Arguing, not arguing with me. I would read the scripture. And I would, it was where Jesus said, God is more important than even your family is, your sons, your daughters, your brothers and sisters. And this woman said, well, I was always taught that family comes first. And I'm going, ma'am, I'm reading the Bible. I'm just reading what Jesus said. And she argued with me in Sunday school. And I'm just going, Ugh. she left. Not that service, but she left not too long after that. What I'm saying to you is, Thank you, sir. Amen. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth. Be not rash with thy mouth. Amen? That means think before you talk. And then maybe you ought to, what you're going to say, maybe you ought to chew that up and swallow it and not say it. Be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Meaning, you don't know what God knows. And therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. It means they won't shut up. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. 
pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it, and by the way, if you can't pay a vow to God, you shouldn't have vowed it. Amen? I never promised God that I would be righteous and holy and never do anything wrong. I knew better than to do that because I knew I couldn't do it. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. In other words, don't you ever say to God his word is wrong. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hand? Let God be true and every man a liar. Spirit of truth or spirit of error. You have to, you and you alone have to ask yourself, which one do you have? Which one abides in you? Which one causes you to do the things that you do, say the things that you say, and live the way that you live? Which spirit is in you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you, Lord, for your word. And Father, if there's anybody in this room tonight that ought to take heed to that, it is me. Father, teach me how to listen. Teach me how to learn better. Teach me how to avoid vain and profane and babblings and arguments. Teach me, Father, how to listen to people when they talk instead of over-talking them. Father, give us the spirit of truth that we never, ever, ever turn away from thy word. Father, we ask once again that you bless Brother Roy and Sister Bonnie. Lord, in these last few weeks of her life here on this earth, we know, Father, that she'll be with you, but we pray, God, that you would comfort her now and comfort Brother Roy now and in all the days that follow. Father, bless your word tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen.